Parsons not a heel into it. Not a heel into it, yeah. Didn't he? Kel did that as well. And it was like, you know, it was like in the credits I'm sure someone's done it, but do it anyway. The cops are right there. So you're not from Sydney at all, or so are you kind of um, like a hick or something <laughs> to people in yeah. Sydney? Yeah, they call them bogans in Australia. They're just kind of like your Australian equivalent of like a an American redneck or something like that. My mom's born here. She was uh, born in South Australia, and my dad is born in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. And yeah, I grew up like 20 kilometers out of the city, but yeah, it's still considered Sydney. It's just the the western suburbs. I wouldn't change the way I grew up or anything or where I grew up because it teaches you a lot about life from like an early age, just like being around like junkies or just shit people, you know. He told me the story that this Aboriginal lady that there's Oxford Street in Sydney, which is kind of like the main drag and, and there's this one lady that's been there for years and all the skaters know her. She came up, she asked me like what tribe I was from and I was like, oh no, I'm not Aboriginal, I'm like African or whatever. She goes, yeah, but you've got like light skin on. And I was like, yeah, my dad's African and my mum's Caucasian or whatever. She said, you're half the fucking white devil and she punched me in the face. There wasn't many black people besides like really dark like Nigerian taxi drivers and he's half white. That's his side that's like, you know, he loves Morrissey, he loves like the same, we, we pretty much love the same music. But then he's got his black side too where he's like fully down for all the hip hop and shit. But, He's a pretty sensitive, like, white boy, really. <laughs> when I was a little kid and my brother used to take me into skate, all the older guys would call me, like, a Westie, which is what you call someone from the Western suburbs. Because the Western suburbs isn't exactly the most, like, beautiful area of Sydney. Knowing from growing up there, like, the Western suburbs is full of, like, some heavy people. You would go past this, like, correctional facilities to get to his house. And where he skated, the neighbourhood was fucking... It was Trife. They had a little skate park, but it, it was crazy that they even had a skate park. That's where I learned everything. Standard dick drawing. <laughs> Fuck. Everything's so much like smaller than I remember. It's all just like prefab. That's like comes from a factory they pull where- pull the slab and then they just bring it, they order the, the park and then they just bring it here and just chuck it down. Chima's brother was like the, the older dude with cornrows that was hanging out that was like the cool guy. Yes, yeah, the whole reason why I started skating definitely would have been because of him. I just used to, like you do with your older brother or whatever, you just do whatever they do, I guess. One more. I wouldn't say he's my mentor or anything like that, but definitely got me into it and like kept me doing it. Yeah! I remember burning a couch on here. <laughs> the first time I actually met him would have been like 2003. I started skating in the city a lot. You didn't have to speak to anyone, you just went there and you knew you could see all your friends from Sydney. He was super young and he was skating the rails and like just flying off stuff. When, when I first met him as a little kid, you know, he was just jumping off everything, literally backside when eating everything in sight. And I used to come to Sydney all the time because I had friends up here, Davo, Michael Davidson. Davo had a lot to do with Chima and getting him recognized because they were both from out in the Western suburbs. I've seen him muck around a few times. But I didn't know he was getting so serious and, and then I went skating with him and he's doing like front boards down 10 stairs when he's a little tiny kid. Just consistency and just insanely good. We said that whole generation just started, it started changing, you know. 
coming back and forth, you know, every time you come back, Chima would be bigger and he'd have more tricks and more pop. Then he was, he got on a company, Juice Clothing, and then Guy Miller really helped Chima evolve. From then on, you knew Chima was going to be the man. He's such a good, good kid, and you could always see him, like, doing well. I always respected how Chima would think of a trick, get one trick, and leave. If you're a smarter skater, you'd realize you just do one or two outstanding things, and that's all you need to stand out from the crowd. Definitely one of the first people that helped me, like Aaron Jenkins. I don't know if you interviewed him, but he owns a skate shop back in Sydney, which I was riding for, and he was also on Juice at the time. It was like Chima, Cal Nusk, Jeff Skunk Williams. They had the best team in Australia. Like for an all Australian team, they had the best team. Chima was just on a mission every weekend. Before he quit school, he was just like school all week, and then weekend came, like going to the city, meet up by 11, get in the car, and then. So I made a video with, uh, with my friend Jamie Fazakli called Kill Yourself. It was like our own independent video. That was like the first skate video that I ever made. And Chima had last part in that video. But it was like all our friends from Sydney. Yeah, Chima kind of killed everything. Especially like around the Kill Self time, it was just so crazy. It was like, what other thing did he get to add to his part? We'd filmed a line from the start where he like, he switched back way to the stairs. I think he did like a nollie flip. He did something on like a barrier. And then we started pushing. And it was like, just push him, push him, push him, push him, push him. And then he just, oh, at least it's 17 stair. And everyone's just like, oh my God, that's the way you're gonna start a video part, your first video part. So then the next weekend he was like, okay, I'm gonna come and kickflip it. Everyone's there and everyone's just fucking losing their mind. And then that day, he went and did two other gnarly tricks that day. We saw this video and you're like, holy shit, you just know when you see a guy skating that he's incredibly talented um, and that you're like, this guy would be a great part of our gig. And that put him on our radar straight up. You didn't have YouTube and you didn't have this instant access to see how good a kid is. Like it was harder for him to send the message that he's really good. That was really special to me that like, any kid anywhere who just fucking skates really good, does it their way with their friends and has fun doing it, can become a pro skater. It's quite easy to rise to the top of the Australian industry and get sponsors and get in the magazines, but then when you go to America, it's, it's like you're starting all over again. It's hard because the industry is still based off the American industry so much. Inevitably, like for your career, you're going to kind of have to be in America. Anybody that saw that as their future definitely had to look up to Dustin in the way that he'd gone about it, whether they look up to his skating or not. And Dustin's mentored everybody through that. He's always been around to help out. Coming from Australia, like, I'm from the western suburbs of Sydney and he's from the Blue Mountains, which is, like, really west of Sydney, like, way out. We both kind of grew up in, like, a similar, kind of like Bogan people, like, the crazy people you see out there. <laughs> he used to give me shit. Just say things to me that would just uh, cut deep to like a 14 or 15 year old kid. This is your idol or something. He was really shy. He was like 15 when he stayed at my house, but I was already getting terrifyingly drunk and he must have saw that pretty crazy back then, but he's kind of turned into a bit of a maniac himself. <laughs> 